Well, welcome everyone to the Forgotten Scenery Element, my two-part how-to video on installing and weathering track. You know, track is what I call the forgotten scenery element. You know, when it comes to track, you know, many of us are content just add paint to the sides of the rails, uh, put some paint along the ties, add some ballast, and you know, calling it done. And there's nothing wrong with that. But you know, like everything else in the real world, the appearance of track is not always uniform if we take a closer look. Traffic volume, weather, and time are just a few of the things that can affect the appearance of track. Then you add in dirt, grime, oil, vegetation overgrowth, and trash along the right of way, and we quickly see track becomes a scenery element in its own right. So I've divided this how-to video on track into two parts. The first part will cover the prep and installation of roadbed and track. And this is a critical part of the entire project because, you know, quite simply, even the best track weathering job will be overlooked if we are continuously fighting problems stemming from poor track installation. In the second video to be released later, we'll cover painting rails and ties, ballasting, weathering, and adding interesting elements to the right of way to make your scene look more realistic. So for this project, I'm going to be installing uh, an industry spur in an area that will have uh, a future feed mill. And so I'm starting out here with Atlas Code 83 flex track. Now the first step is to make the Atlas Code 83 track look more like track you would see along an industry spur. And this would include the uh, you know less ties and then the remaining ties are kind of uh, spaced out. Some of them might even be uh, crooked. So what I'm doing is taking some wire cutters here and I'm very carefully uh, cutting and removing some of the plastic ties. Now, I don't put a lot of pressure on the cut. And the reason being is if I start cutting and all of a sudden the wire cutters stop, I know I've gone too low, I've hit the metal rail and I can back off a little bit before accidentally cutting the rail. Now, uh, another option for industry spurs is going with Code 70 track. Uh, they make some really nice Code 70 track out there. Um, but if you're like me, you have some extra Code 83, like in this case, and you want to save a little bit of money, I mean, you can do this just to create an industry spur, and once it's weathered and, and finished, it looks just fine. So now that I've got some of the ties cut away, I'm going to go ahead and just make sure that the rail joiners fit on uh, all the ends of my track here. And I'll also test the uh, section of track that I'm joining this section to. And this is just a really good step, uh, especially before, you know, you get in there and you have that glue down. You know, that's not the time to figure out that there's a small defect there. It won't let those rail joiners go on. So this is a recommended step with any type of track or turnout that you put in before, before you're ready to install it. Now, with some of the ties cut away, what I'm doing here is I'm going back. I'm spacing out the remaining ties. And again, you don't want this uniform. You want some of the ties to be a little bit further apart than others. Um, the other thing I'm checking for, too, is to make sure the rail is, is stable. You don't want the ties so far apart that you're going to have derailment problems. For industry spurs, I use the two millimeter foam sheets and I just cut these out the, the width of the track. And I've got this uh, secured to my base with full strength Mod Podge. Now the first thing I'm going to do here is just lay the, the track on top of the roadbed and I'm going to look for any issues. And the first thing I spot here is there's quite a bit of a gap there that I need to correct. So what is causing the gap here is the piece of foam insulation board on the left, it, it has a slight defect where it kind of dips down in the middle. So this creates a, the gap. So that's easily fixed. I'm just going to take another piece of the two millimeter foam insulation board here and I'm going to glue it on top of the other one. And that should even everything out. So I've marked the area uh, with a thumbtack where the, the dip begins. And this is where I'm going to start applying the full strength Mod Podge. And I've just basically got one of my trusty old cheap foam brushes. You can buy these in packs of you know, 15 or 20. They're good for stuff like this. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take another section, uh, the same width as the bottom section of the 2 millimeter foam, and I'm just going to lay it right on top. So I've got the Mod Podge down. So now I'm taking my 2 millimeter foam strip, and I have it cut the same width as the bottom section. And I'm just going to put it here in... Make sure the edges match up and then we'll put a little bit of pressure and go across the foam strip just to make sure everything is, is tacked down really well. Now we'll need to secure this down um, for a few hours and, and let the Mod Podge dry. Normally I use like heavy objects um, for weights, but uh, in this case I had all these on 
being used in other projects, so I'm just kind of using thumbtacks, which is fine in this case here. It just takes a little bit of longer. But the main thing is to make sure uh, that the top piece uh, is, is tacked down and it doesn't start curling up or moving during the, the drying process of the Mod Podge. So I've come back the, uh, the next day and I've got the thumbtacks removed. So here what I'm doing is I've just lay the piece of track on top of the section um, that I glued down the previous day. And what I'm doing is I'm just making sure that the uh, track sits level and rolling a, a car across here just to make sure there's not any areas that I might need to correct before I finally glue the track down. So I need to add another section here uh, to complete the length of the industry spur. Um, and so the rail here is just a little bit longer than what I need where the tracks will join. So basically I'm just taking a ruler and I'm going to make sure everything is square and then I'm going to mark the cut sections with a pencil. So the next step is to cut off that excess rail. And again, I have this mark where I need to cut with a, a dark leaded pencil. And for this, I'm using uh, a Dremel with a cutting blade. Now, one advantage I like about the, the Dremel over uh, rail cutters or nippers is the cuts tend to be smooth. So I'm, I usually don't have to go back and do any type of filing. One thing you do want to be aware of is they do generate heat. So when you're working around plastic ties, just be aware of that. So what I've done here is I've got the second section of track needed to finish out the length of the spur. And I'm just making sure the two tracks go together. There's no gaps or anything. And obviously I don't need the full length of the second track to finish out the spur. So what I'll do is like the first section of track is I'll mark the end and just cut it with a Dremel tool and then uh, remove the, uh, the extra track. All right, so here you see a picture of the installed track. And uh, the steps are, are very similar to when you saw, I was, when you saw me putting in uh, the road bed with the Mod Podge. Uh, basically what I do is I just take full strength Mod Podge and I'll brush a good layer of that on the road bed. Uh, then I will put the track down on top of that and either secure it with weights or thumbtacks and let it dry overnight. So here what I've done is I've gone in and I've soldered uh, the rail joints uh, for the long section of track, the 36 inch, as well as the, the shorter piece at the end of the spur. All right, so the next step is to run the feeder wires. So using my Dremel tool, I'm drilling um, a hole for the feeder wires. And I'm, you know, when drilling this, just kind of be aware. You want to you want to drill uh, close to the track, but just remain aware so you're not hitting the rail and uh, melting any ties. Okay, well, I've got the feeder wires run down the holes I just drilled. And you notice I've got uh, some solder on the uh, portion of the feeder wires where they've been stripped. And I've also got a little bit of solder along the outside side of the rails where I'm going to attach the wire. So what I'm going to do here is just take some needle nose and I'm going to bend the soldered section of the feeder wire at a 90 degree angle. What I'm doing is kind of getting a like a, a hook shape where I can just hook these onto the sides of the rail where I intend to solder. So after I bend them, what I'm going to do is go back and I'm going to try to make this section here that will go up against the track just as flat as can be. So I'm just kind of going and just doing a squeeze here. So the portion of the feeder wire I have bent at a 90 degree angle is just a little bit long. So I'm just gonna take some uh, wire cutters here and cut off that excess. Cause what we wanna do here is just have just a little bit of a, of a hook section so we can uh, attach it along the sides of the track where that solder is. Okay, so now I'm gonna attach the feeder wire to the track. So Got my pliers, I'm gonna push the feeder wire against the track and you see that area of track, I've already got a little bit of solder. And I'm taking my soldering iron and I'm pushing it against the track and you notice it's starting to melt the solder. And it's gonna give me a good strong connection there. And once I'm done, I'm going to take my uh, needle nose pliers and after just a few seconds to give that time for that solder to cool, I'm gonna kind of tap the wire on both sides just to make sure the connection is strong and it's not going to go anywhere. So when I was soldering, you may have noticed an object in the upper right hand corner. And what that is, is a pocket mirror. I've got it uh, pictured here. And that allows me to be able to solder the back side of the track where I can't see. And I tell you that not only soldering, but this has really come in handy for scenery and ballasting work. Um, where maybe it's on the back side of the layout or, you know, along the track where I can't see. So it's really a good tool to keep on hand. So for this layout, I've decided to use suitcase connectors uh, to connect the feeder wires to my bus wires. 
Now on previous layouts, you know, I would just solder the feeder wires uh, to the bus wires, but you know, getting a little bit older and you know, crawling underneath the the layout in awkward positions while holding a soldering gun just doesn't have the the fun and thrill that it that it used to have. So I went with the suitcase connectors in this one, and I know there's still some debate out there on you know using suitcase connectors or not using suitcase connectors and reliability. But kind of doing the research and then talking to some model railroaders that have had these in place for years without a problem, I'm, I'm pretty well convinced it's not the suitcase connectors that cause the issue, but just the poor installation. So I'm going to show you how to do that. So when it comes to DCC and wiring, um, I'm a believer in heavier is better. So I go with a 12 gauge stranded for my bus wires and a 16 to 18 gauge stranded uh, for my feeder wires. Now, as far as suitcase connectors to join these together, um, at least the 3M brand, um, I'm using number 567. So that designation might be different if you're using a different brand, but the main thing to know is not all suitcase connectors are the same. So when picking one, you need to make sure that, that suitcase connector is designed to put your two gauges of wire together. Now, instead of trying to hold the camera steady underneath the layout um, to show you how to install a suitcase connector, Thought it'd be easy just to create a little demo here. So this suitcase connector is designed for my two gauges of wire. Uh, the 12 gauge stranded would go in the larger hole and the small feeder wire, the 16 to 18 would go in the smaller hole there. And you have a little metal piece that once it's crimped down, it cuts the insulation, touches the two wires and gives you a connection. So let's say this uh, 12 gauge strand here is the bus that's running uh, underneath the layout. So basically what I'm gonna do is push that, the suitcase connector onto that wire. You notice it's got a little open section there. It's kind of like um, a tight mouth. And then on the other hole there, you would put your feeder wire. And this actually is, is closed on the other end. So you'd kind of just give it a, a gentle push and you'll feel it go up in there and stop. And once that's in there, then you would just crimp down that metal piece. Now they actually make a crimpers design for suitcase connectors, but I, I found uh, like channel locks work just as well. So what you're wanting to do here is you're wanting to crimp these down until the metal piece is all the way down. And I'll show you a picture here of the, the uh, finished uh, product. And basically what that's doing is a metal piece comes down, it cuts the insulation of both wires, it doesn't actually cut the wire, and makes a bridge or a connection. So still gotta crimp that one end down, it needs to sit flat. And then once that's done, then there's like that little plastic door. You just snap that closed and that kind of protects uh, everything there and you're done. So if you've done it properly, um, when you install your suitcase connector, here's, here's what the end result should look like. Um, the metal piece, which is joining the two wires, uh, the top of it will sit flush with the top section of the suitcase connector. It should be perfectly flat. So if you see that sticking up or it's crooked, you don't have a good connection error and you want to go back and you want to crimp that till it's flat. Now the last step that we're going to do in part one of the series is we're going to kind of fill in that gap where we have some missing ties and and you see this a lot you know when you're joining um, two sections of rail together but it's very simple to correct this. So to fill in that blank area uh, between the two sections of track what I'm doing here is I'm taking ties and these are the ones that I cut away earlier uh, from the industry spur and you want to be careful here. Um, these things act on knives, as you know, are pretty sharp. Um, but all you, all you do is just cut away the excess plastic from the ties. And it doesn't have to be, be perfect. Um, because once you do uh, your weathering and the painting and everything like that, ballasting, this will, you know, all the imperfections will disappear. So I've cut the, the you know, little excess plastic off the side. And then I'm going to cut the little clips uh, that you know, join the, this plastic tie to the rail. So if once you've finished cutting away the excess plastic, um, your ties should look something like this. Again, any of the imperfections, um, once you paint, weather and ballast, it's gonna disappear. So for the final step, I'm just gonna take one of the ties and I'm just gonna slide it in the middle of that blank area between the two sections of track. And one of the things I'm gonna look for is once it's in place is uh, I'm gonna look for you know, any, any problems, like if it's pushing the rail up you know, something that might cause a derailment, and that's easily fixed. You can just take the tie and very carefully with an X-Acto knife kind of shave it down where it's not doing that. Um, the other thing too, because this is an industry spur, 
you know, I'm not worried about, you know, the tie spacing being exact. Um, now this fits pretty snug in there, um, but if it was loose, you could just add, you know, Mod Podge or white glue, you know, just to keep that tie in place. So for my spur, when I place the tie to fill in the, the section between um, the two sections of track, you know, I wasn't really concerned about having uniform tie spacing, you know, it's an industry spur. But what if you're modeling track where the tie spacing is pretty uniform? Well, what I do is I'll create a template. So here, what I've done is I've measured the distance between ties on the rail that I'm working with. And then I've gone back and I've cut a small piece of cork road bed, the width that I measured out. And I just use that, you know, the template is kind of a guide as I'm placing the tie. So you see here, um, I'm just sliding in the tie and I'm working my left hand so you can, you can see me. So usually it goes a lot smoother than this, but anyway, it's pretty simple. Um, I'll slide in the ties and then I'll take that, you know, that little template there and I'll adjust the ties until, you know, it's, it's right up against that cork and bam, you know, I've got uniform tie spacing. Now you may find when you're having to make adjustments and fit ties in there to fill in that gap that you might have to adjust a little bit where it's not exactly uniform. But if, if it's just a small amount, it's not going to be noticeable. So here are some additional tips when installing track. And these are just things I've learned in my time in the hobby. Um, very important here is don't guess plan. So avoid what I call the, the starry eyed syndrome where, you know, for example, you know, you've got this great industry plan. And so you've, you know, you've put the track down, you got the, you know, everything is weathered and it's looking really good. And then that's the time you figure out that the industry that you're going to put in there doesn't fit. All right. So draw it out, take measurements, you know, just, just plan before you do anything. Start with a smooth, clean base. And so before you put the road bed down, make sure that area is vacuumed and you don't have any, you know, major defects on, on the base that you're doing the installation that's going to cause, you know, derailment problems or installation problems down the road. Smooth height transitions. Uh, so for example, your, your main line is usually going to sit higher than say like an industry spur. So this is one time you, you don't want to model what you see in the real world. You know, railroads tend to deal with height transitions uh, or sudden height transitions uh, a lot better than uh, our model railroads. So for model railroad, when you're going between two different track uh, heights, you want to make sure that the transition is very smooth and gradual. Um, otherwise, you're going to run into derailment problems. Don't ignore issues. And, you know, we're all guilty of this from time to time. Um, you know, for example, yeah, there, I, there's, you know, there's been times like I'll have, you know, my tracks in, it's ballasted, and it's looking good, and I start running trains. And then every now and then, you know, there's a derailment in that area, um, or maybe cars, you know, will uncouple and and it's, you know, it's intermittent. So I, I really just, I just say, oh, you know, I'm just going to put up with it. But then it kind of becomes that itch you just can't scratch and it, it you know starts bugging you and really it's just it's better just you know to take care of it so again you know, don't ignore the issue you know do the right thing and fix it you know take it in steps and this is for you know whether it's track or you know scenery or really anything with with model railroading um you know don't try to do it all at once you know it takes time um, you know, track, especially, you know, when you get into ballasting and some of this other stuff, it can become tedious. So just, just do it in steps. You know, the main thing is just be consistent and, and it'll get done, but you don't want to just, you know, try to just rush, do everything at once. You start making mistakes. Avoid when tired. And really this is kind of a good life rule, uh, not only model railroading, but we're all guilty of it. You know, we're tired, maybe not feeling good, but man, we're going to work on that model railroad project and you know, you, you start kind of screwing up or, you know, you think you do it right. You come back the next day and you, you see where you've kind of messed up and, you know, you're like, oh man, I'm, I'm tired. You know, I shouldn't have done this. I'm gonna have to go back and correct some stuff. So it's okay to say, you know, something, I, I'm just not going to deal with it right now. I'll come back when I'm feeling better. Um, it, it'll save you heartache in the long run. Well, thanks for watching everyone. And hopefully you've picked up on some things that's going to help you with your own track installation projects. Now, part two is coming very soon. And for part two, we're going to get into the painting, ballasting, uh, the track weathering, doing some extras, including modeling the right of way, which I think you're going to find, you know, everything combined is really going to make that track come alive in, in a major part of your scenery. So we'll see you next time.